Praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters, and I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I greet you from God the Father, and as always, the indwelling power of Holy Spirit. I am again Prophet Elijah from Sound Doctrine Deliverance Ministries of Emporia, Virginia, and I just want to say good morning to you this morning. Send a special good morning to Pastor Rainey over in the Philippines. God bless you, my brother. I love you. Stay strong. Stay focused. Continue doing the things that God has called you to do, knowing that all things work together for your good. Amen. Send a special good morning to Bishop Curtis Bunn of Royal Rapids, North Carolina. Send a special good morning to Apostle Timothy Thornton and his wife down in Norfolk, Virginia. I just bless God for this day. It's a beautiful day. Now, I know I usually uh, come to you all on Thursdays, and a few of you reached out and asked me, uh, was everything okay? Was everything going on? Yes, God is wonderful. God is blessing. He had us doing some things, helping some people out in the name of Jesus on some assignments, and it was just absolutely wonderful. But I want you to know that I was thinking about you, ready and prepared to give this message because it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful word. And it's something that, Today, we really, truly need, amen. Um, with so much going on in the world today, um, so much going on in the name of religion, there are people going to and fro with every wind of doctrine that, that there are some that's genuinely seeking, okay, and don't know where to turn. There are some that's confused. There are some that's... Um, going along with what has always been the norm. Um, you have some that haven't gone back to service since COVID hit, for whatever reason. Some churches haven't opened back up. Um, some people feel like they may have outgrown the ministry they were in, or, or, or some people just feel like it's time for a change. And with all of this going on, um, we're now living in a time and in an age, especially with the, the web, the internet out here the way it is, that you can pick up a message like you can go in a store and pick up a loaf of bread. All you have to do is click on, find a channel, sit down, listen to somebody, and, and, and go on about your day. And a lot of people are okay with this. But there's something going on that we have to be knowledgeable of and we have to be mindful of. It's been going on for a while now. But now is the time. This day and this age in the church is the time where we really have to open our eyes, open our ears, and understand what it is we're seeing and what it is we're hearing. Because there's a deception going on that some of us have a surface knowledge of, but we haven't really looked at it. So we're going to look at it this morning because... If I had to give you uh, a, a, a title, a thought, anything like that, it would be identifying the counterfeit because that's what we're going to be talking about because that's what's necessary, especially men and women of God who stand before others as leaders proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to be able to identify the counterfeit. Now, what do I mean when I say identify the counterfeit? I want you to think about something. When we look at counterfeit money, or even before you look at counterfeit money, if you go into a store, if you go into a restaurant, if you go in, into any type of business to make a transaction and you go to pay, most times if you pull out a $100 bill, sometimes a $50 bill, you'll notice now that they'll take the bill and either hold it up to the light or they'll get some special type of light to run it across the back of the bill to see if it's real or not. They're trying to identify the counterfeit. A lot of people in the art world, when somebody comes in with a piece of art and it's supposed to be from the masters or the original, they have a special light that they can run across the canvas from top to bottom, from side to side. And they're looking for certain watermarks. They're looking for anything that's up under the paint. They're looking for anything that will identify it as an original or expose it as a counterfeit. This is the same thing 
my beautiful brothers and sisters, that we're supposed to be doing as children of the Most High God. We're supposed to be able to identify the counterfeit. And the problem we're having is some people are so used to seeing counterfeit that they're unable to recognize the genuine article when they come across it. Now I'm not talking about money. Now I'm not talking about art. I'm talking about in the church. We have become so accustomed to some things that are counterfeit, but that we have been experiencing for so long that when the genuine move of God is in our presence, when the genuine man or woman of God is in our presence, we can't identify or receive it because it's opposite of the counterfeit. It's close, but it's different. So God showed me a couple of scriptures. And we say God is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow past, present, and future. And it's amazing that this counterfeit was going on, past, present, and future. But we read it, and we read it for the time frame it was in, not applying it to right now. So I've got a couple of scriptures I want to share with you, and I want you to write these down. But if you go to Genesis chapter 7, If you hear noise in the background, pay no attention to it. It's my wife making noise while I'm doing a live, but to God be the glory. If we go to Genesis chapter 7. I want to show you a few things. You know what? Nope. I wrote my notes wrong. We're going to Exodus chapter 7. Thank you, Lord. Go to Exodus chapter 7. And this is when God was sending Moses to Pharaoh to tell him to let his people go. Okay? We know that Moses went before Pharaoh, and through Moses, God was performing some miracles. He was, he was, he was doing some things that they hadn't seen, per se. Okay? Now, if you go to, if you're in Exodus chapter 7, and you go to verse 11, now watch what I'm doing. Then Pharaoh, also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So we know this is when God told Moses to throw down his rod, it became a serpent. Pharaoh had his visit, his magicians, his sorcerers, his soothsayers throw down their rods, and they became serpents. Go in that same chapter, and we're going over to verse 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as unto the Lord. Now, what's going on right here? The river was turned to blood. Moses did it. Pharaoh's magicians did it. Go over to chapter 8. And it's talking about when he smote the dust. But when you get in verse 18, it says, And the magicians did so with their enchantments, and they brought forth lice. But they couldn't. No, they tried to bring forth lice, but they couldn't. The counterfeit had to stop. The first three miracles that Moses did, the magicians were able to counterfeit and do the same thing. So they were saying there's no distinction between what Moses is doing in the name of his God and what we're doing in the name of Pharaoh. That's past. The next one I want you to go to. Go to 2 Thessalonians. I told you God is a God of past, present, and future. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And starting at verse 7, the word of God says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let it until he be taken out of the way. 
And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now listen to verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved present. Go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to start at verse 1. Now listen. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his ten horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. Now listen. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? I have told you before, and I will always tell you, Satan has power and authority. It's limited, but down here on earth, because scripture calls him the God of this world, even though it's a small G. But he has power and authority to do certain things in the spiritual realm, which are manifested in the natural realm. We just read scripture from past, present, and future of when he's doing these things. And the reason it's important for us to know this is because he is now doing this in the church, in the name of religion. And as I said when I first started, the problem is so many people in church are so used to seeing the counterfeit that you don't recognize the genuine article when God presents it to you. Because there is a counterfeit that's going on in the church. There's a counterfeit that's going on in the world. And the time and era that we live in, especially with this internet and everything else going on, if you're not able to recognize and make a distinction between what's of God and what's of Satan, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I, got, I want to show you with two more passages. 2 Corinthians. Write these down. Research it for yourself. Don't believe me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I really need you to get these two scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to start at verse 13. Listen to what the word of God says. For such are false apostles. We're going to pause. We're going to let that sink in. Because unless God was addressing this to the church, why would he use the term apostles? And if there was no counterfeit, why would he use the term false? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Brothers and sisters, how much more clear can that be? I'm going to start it again. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now watch this. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of the light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose ends shall be according to their works. That is as plain as it can be said and written. If there's true apostles, there's false apostles. If there's true workers, there's deceitful workers. 
If there's a power of the light, there's a power of darkness. And you can see right here, Satan has people imitating the things of God, but they are deceitful and their end is destruction. And too many people that's grown up in the church, but have not grown up yet in Christ, are falling for the counterfeit because they cannot or have not been taught how to recognize and receive the genuine article. I have one more passage that I have to give you because Jesus told us these things were going to happen. Go to Matthew chapter 24. And when you get to chapter 24, I'm just going to read two verses, 23 and 24. And it says, and it's talking about the end times. Then it shall, excuse me, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Listen to this next verse. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. Notice Corinthians saying false apostles. Now this one is saying false prophets. Listen. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, listen to this next words, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall believe, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, brothers and sisters, Jesus warned us, Holy Spirit let us know that there is going to be a time, and it's the time that we're living in right now, that Satan is coming full force with a deception that is so convincing and so powerful that if you don't know, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be fooled. You're going to be bamboozled. And it's going on right now today. I said at the beginning, when we go into a business and we go to pay for something and we use a $100 bill or $50 bill or anything higher, we see them take that thing and put a light to it. And they run it up and down because they're looking for marks that's supposed to be there. But when they're not there, they're able to identify that thing as a counterfeit. The same thing goes on in our spiritual life. When we hear a man, a woman, or anybody else stand before us declaring the things of God, when we see somebody that called themselves an apostle, when we see somebody that called themselves a prophet, when we see somebody that called themselves a bishop, when we see somebody that called themselves an evangelist, a missionary, or anything else that pertains to God, there is a special light that we can hold up to them. And if certain things aren't identified or certain things are missing, then we can call that thing a counterfeit. The light is the word of God. The light is the anointing of the Holy Spirit because that exposes everything. I don't care how long you've been standing in the church or how long you've been in the pulpit, how big your name has gotten. That doesn't matter when it comes to God. When Holy Spirit is present, when the word of God is rightly divided and is compared to the things that you've been teaching and proclaiming and things are missing, then that's counterfeit. Because the word tells us that everything has to line up, line upon line, precept upon precept. God does not put something in his word for one generation and then change it or alter it for somebody else and then take it out completely for somebody else. God is complete. God is whole. God is one as is his word. So how do we identify the counterfeit? And what are some other elements of counterfeit that we've been dealing with for so long? And it's funny because if you look in the natural, especially you women, I'm going to pick on you women for a minute. You women go to these swap meets, these flea markets, see something online. Oh, girl, I got the hat at. And you spend all of this money on purses. You spend all of these money on shoes. You might buy you what you think is a good wig and you, you excited. You done told everybody about it and you get it in the mail and you realize the stitching 
isn't right. The words of the designer isn't lining up. You already know that the designer is based in China, but yours say made in Germany. But unless you knew what the genuine article of that pair of shoes or that purse looked like, you would not be able to identify the counterfeit. And there's so many people that get bamboozled every day with their pocketbooks, with their jewelry, because they don't know. You can go down, you could used to go down on Broad Street in Richmond and buy you a Rolex for $30, $40. And you just so happy and you dancing around and you showing everybody your Rolex and all your friends are at all that you have a Rolex, but you only work at 7-Eleven, but you running around with your Rolex on and you're excited about that thing until a real Rolex shows up. And when a real Rolex shows up, it exposes everything that yours is supposed to be, but it's not. And you yourself, you're not able to recognize the difference between yours and the genuine until the genuine is right there to compare it with. The same principle applies with the word. You can hear somebody preach a wonderful sermon. You can hear somebody talk about all the things that God has called them to do. I laid hands on this person and they got up and, and I prayed over this person and this happened. But that does not mean they are genuine in the eyes of God. That does not mean they were sent, ordained, anointed by Holy Spirit because scripture just told us that Satan has his deceitful workers doing what lying wonders out there in the world today. And too many of our people are being deceived because they haven't gotten in the word they haven't prayed for a spirit of discernment. They're not able to identify if it's of God and if it's not because tradition doesn't teach them to do that. Because denomination does not teach them to do that. Tradition teaches you we go along and do this because grandma did it and her mother before that and her father before that. That's what tradition teaches you. Denomination teaches you the Bible says this. But we don't receive it that way. This is the way we choose to receive it, and this is the way we choose to teach it. So both tradition and denomination has moved away from the genuine article and have become counterfeit. And these things can damage your relationship with God, first and foremost. But it also can alter the way we teach our children. What are you talking about? We have a counterfeit worship that goes on in the church today. And some of you are about to get one of those ouch moments. Some of us are about to have an amen moment, but some of us are about to get an ouch moment. There is a counterfeit worship that's in the church today. And it's deceived 80% of church goers. Because they were so used to seeing the counterfeit that they don't see, recognize, or receive genuine worship, genuine praise. What am I talking about? We always read in the scripture how David danced before the Lord with all his might. What else does that story tell us? That story tells us that Micah, who was David's wife at the time, she was watching and she was mad. Because his clothes got, you know, shooken up a little bit. And she went and addressed it to David. And David let her know, this is where God found me. This is where God bought me from. This is what God chose me over your family. This is why I dance. This is why I sing. This is why I shout. And if you're mad about that, knowing what God is going to continue to do for me, you ain't seen nothing yet. David was fully and consciously aware of what he was doing and why he was doing it. That was pure worship. That was pure praise. People in the church today use that passage to justify what they call a move of the spirit when the drums get the beating 
and the piano is playing, and the bass is jumping, and the lead guitar is jumping. The dun 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 dun. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And people get to flipping and flopping all over the church, falling over the drum set, diving across the pool pit, flipping back in chairs, hitting people in the face. Get that is a counterfeit. That is not a genuine worship and praise. And we have seen it in the church for so long that we receive it as genuine and it's not. It has gotten to the point where you can see the little children in the church trying to imitate what they see the adults do because it has been in the church in the name of religion for so long. Now, am I saying that we don't dance in the Lord today? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, just as scripture dictated, when David danced, and that is the only person that scripture let us know danced in that fashion. Because we know Miriam and them, they danced and they sang praises to God. David danced before the Lord with all his might. Everybody knew what they were doing. Everybody was respectful because God is a respectful God. God does not cause you to embarrass yourself, hurt yourself, or hurt anybody else. But in the church today, we have seen people get hurt. When somebody called themselves, the Holy Spirit fell on me, fell from where? The Holy Spirit dwells within us. Yes, the Spirit can get stirred up. But the Holy Spirit never causes us to act in a way that's out of order, act in a way that's borderline satanic. And why do I say that? Because I told you a couple weeks ago, if you go back and study a lot of the things that go on in the church today, a lot of this stuff comes from old slave customs and old voodoo customs. And if you ever take the time to do some research and watch when the voodoo drums get to going and watch the voodoo rhythm and watch their movements and watch the things that they do, it's the exact same thing that you see in the church today. Scripture just told us Satan has a counterfeit and his workers have a counterfeit. And it's been in the church for so long that a lot of us receive it as genuine and it is not. So when you get happy in church, when you feel something, yes, you can you can do a little dance. You can cut a little step if you're rejoicing and praising God, but you are aware of what you're doing and you're aware of everybody around you and you're not falling across the pool pit, tripping over the drum set, hitting Sister Wampadilla in her face, knocking her hat off. You're not doing any of that because that's not of God. And nowhere in scripture, nowhere from Genesis to Revelation, nowhere can you find that. Nowhere can you find the Holy Spirit moving a person to hurt themselves or somebody else. It's not in scripture. Nowhere can you find where they were worshiping and this was going on. It's not in scripture. But if you go to other religions, you find it all over the place. We're exposing the counterfeit today. What else goes on? You hear a lot of teaching that goes on in church. Here's another one of those ouch moments. You hear a lot of teaching that goes on in church and you see a lot of traditions that take place in church that is not the genuine article. And at one point in time, almost all of us was guilty of it. What are you talking about? Every year, at the end of the year, in the month of December, you can get in your car and you can drive up and down the streets and you will see the churches, the churches with a nativity scene in the front of their church with a, a little white Mary and a, a tall white Joseph and a little white baby Jesus and maybe a couple cows, a goat, a chicken, whatever animals they have in storage. And then you'll see three kings and some gifts every December 25th. And we have seen this in the church for so long that we receive it as truth. But when we go rightly divide the word of God, when we search the scriptures, we realize it's a counterfeit. It is a lie. Number one, Jesus was not born on December 25th. 
We have already been through this. Now you have some ministers who say, well, we know he wasn't born then, but we adopted this day to recognize the birth of Christ. That is a lie. Because December 25th is plugged into Egyptian mythology, the birth of Ra, the birth of Nimrod, all of these other Egyptian deities, pagan deities, and their celebration was on December the 25th. So when Christian became the legalized religion, Constantine, who was a pagan that became Christian, he simply converted December 25th into the church as the birth of Christ in order to appease the Christians and the pagans so it wouldn't be an uprising. They said it was the birth of Christ because it was also the birth of all these other pagan deities. So all of the festivals still went on. There was no reason to have an uprising. But December 25th is not the birth of Christ. And it's not just that, but nowhere in scripture can you find what churches use as the nativity scene. Because first and foremost, rightly dividing the word of God. When Jesus was born as a babe in the manger, no one saw him but the shepherds. Search your scripture. When the wise men, the Magi, finally came across Christ, he was between one and two in a house with Mary, his mother. Search your scriptures. So that nativity scene is something that people put together to justify again Jesus being born on December 25th. It is a counterfeit. And it has been in the church for so long that you still have churches that have these toy, drive, toy drives and fundraisers to buy gifts for the children on December the 25th. And it has nothing to do with the God we say we serve and the book we say we believe in. Nothing. It is a counterfeit. You see churches in October that have what they call now a harvest fest. And they say they're doing this so the children can have a Halloween. So they don't have to go door to door trick or treat. We'll give them everything right here. It is a counterfeit because Halloween is the most satanic day of the year. All Hallows Eve. You go all the way back to the Druids and that pagan religion. Way back in the Dark Ages to find the root and origins of Halloween. But we adopted it in the church and we teach this thing like it's a part of scripture. And, and we say we're doing it for the children. We say we're doing Christmas for the children. Easter, which is not the resurrection of Christ. Easter was another pagan religion that the church adopted. And they still got eggs and, and we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for the children. It is all counterfeit. Easter was a celebration of prostitution. Easter was a celebration of, of fidelity and sex. We've all heard that term, blank, blank, like rabbits. That's where that came from. The Easter egg was originated from the golden egg of Astarte, which was given to the, breast, the best prostitute in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the kingdom, in the land. And all those other little colorful eggs, it was all a sexual holiday celebration that had nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. And churches celebrated like it's in this word and it's not. And it has been going on for so long that people receive it as the genuine article and it is a counterfeit. And we say, well, God don't mind. God understand we're doing it for the children. But if you get in your word, God said this. What fellowship has light with darkness? He said, touch not the unclean thing. He said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He said, you either for me or you're against me. There is no middle ground. Jesus. So you're either going to be a part of the world or you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, but you cannot be both. And scripture told us that Satan has a counterfeit going on in the church but because people have believed in that counterfeit for so long, when the genuine shows up, they will not receive it. When people show up to tell you 
the truth about these holidays, you don't receive it. I got one even better for you. Let's all get together, take a deep breath, and say, ouch, Sunday is not the Sabbath day. Never have been, never will be. Saturday is the Sabbath. Now, since the resurrection of Christ, we have the liberty and the freedom to worship any day we want to. But when it comes to teaching, we hear ministers stand in the pulpit and declare because Jesus was resurrected on Sunday, he made that the Lord's day, which means he transferred the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. The devil is a lie. You don't find that in scripture nowhere. Because what God said about the Sabbath, and he said it before he even instituted the law. He said it right after creation. He blessed it. He sanked it. He hallowed it. And he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why would God tell us to remember the Sabbath day? He didn't tell us to remember none of the other days. So why did he say remember the Sabbath day? Because we know God has perfect knowledge and perfect wisdom. So God already knew the counterfeit that Satan was going to bring to the world. And it was going to have something to do with his Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is supposed to remind us of everything that God did for us since creation. So why wouldn't Satan want us to not remember it and transfer our thoughts to something else that had nothing to do with God? So he had the Sabbath changed. And the Roman Catholic Church, in their catechism, they take credit for that. They say we change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday because we have the power and authority to do it. Because we are the only true church. We are the only ones that can rightly divide this word. And the whole Christian world follow behind what we told them to do except the seven day of Venice. And we give them so much flack because they choose to follow the genuine article and we follow the counterfeit. And that brings me to this other point of miracles. And this is the one that gets a lot of people. The Bible already told us Satan had power to do lying wonders. The Bible already said how he was he, he healed a head wound. The Bible already said that Satan's deception, listen to me. The Bible told us Satan's deception would be so deep and so powerful that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. So just because you went to a service and you seen somebody you thought got healed or you seen somebody stutter and now they're talking straight, have you held that thing up to the light to find out if it was a genuine article or if it was a counterfeit? Because you got a lot of fake prophets, fake apostles, fake bishops, fake preachers out here with these deceptive works and people are believing it's of God and it's not because they're not researching it. You cannot believe everything your eyes see. Magicians teach you that. Listen to what I just said. You cannot believe everything that you see with your eyes. And if you've ever sat in front of David Copperfield or some of these other magi magicians, they show you that. Well, who was doing the work for Pharaoh? What did the Bible tell us? He said he went to his magicians. So this deception was going on from the beginning of time. And it's going on today in the church. Satan has that authority. He has that power. So we would ask ourselves, why would God even allow him to do that if he knew we could be deceived? The only way you would be deceived by what Satan is doing is if you don't know the power of Holy Spirit. If you don't know the power of God. If you don't know the word of God. Because if you do, God lets you know, that's not me. When, it, when the music going on in church, dun, 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 and all that is going on, God will let you know what's him and what's not. 
God will let you know when the Holy Spirit is moving and stirring somebody up and when it's an emotional response to a spiritual moment because that's what they've been shown their whole life. So they feel like that's what they have to do. And let me give you another one right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for dropping it in my spirit. This thing with tongues. Listen. And a lot of people are about to get mad. And guess what? I don't care. We're exposing the counterfeit. First and foremost, tongue is a gift. Scripture tells us that. Not everybody has the same gift. So when you desire the gift of tongue, because the Bible tells us to let Holy Spirit know what gifts we desire. If you desire the gift of tongue and you go up in somebody's church and they tell you to raise your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, over and over and over and over and start speeding it up so that you're naturally tongue tied. Do not walk out of that church thinking Holy Spirit touched you and you received a tongue. That is a counterfeit. If you walk up to some of these fake apostles and prophets and whoever else, and they tell you to repeat anything over and over and over and over, you are going to naturally become tongue tied. It's a tongue twister. That's what we call them. That is not genuine. So if you desire the gift of tongue, you ask the Holy Spirit for the gift of tongue. If you desire the interpretation of tongue, you ask the Holy Spirit for the interpretation of tongue. And when you receive your heavenly language, you're going to know is real. You're going to know it's of Holy Spirit. But all this say, habada, 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 wap, baba, luba, it's gotten so bad that people in the world make fun of people in the church when they come to tongue. And you can see it on these movies, the comedians, when they talk about the church and you want the Holy Spirit and they say, say a hip hop, a hip, a hip, a hip, a hip, a hip hop. They say an old hip hop songs that sound utterly ridiculous because you don't understand the words, they're equating that to the church because that's how foolish we have allowed the church to become because we've allowed this counterfeit in and we have not exposed it for what it is. We go along to get along because we don't want to hurt nobody's feelings or call nobody out. That's not what the word tells us. We're supposed to stand for truth and righteousness every day. We're supposed to correct wrong when it comes to this word every day and it doesn't matter who it's coming from jesus picked 12 out of that 12 three was his inner circle peter james and john the roman catholic church teaches peter was his absolute favorite because they teach peter's the one standing at the gate deciding who can come in and who can't that's a lie that's a counterfeit. But even Jesus turned to Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't wait to take Peter off somewhere by himself. He corrected that thing right there. Do we have other any other examples of a counterfeit? The Bible tells us about the seven sons of Siva. Jewish exorcist. Who was going about trying to do some lying works and deceitful wonders. They were trying to do something that God didn't call them to do. And do you realize who shined the light on that counterfeit? It was the enemy himself. Jesus, I know. That's a genuine article. Paul, I know. That's a genuine article. But who are you? And what he was saying was, we recognize the power and authority that Jesus operates under. We recognize the power and authority that Paul operates under. You're not operating under Jesus' authority, and you ain't even operating under our authority. So what type of new counterfeit is this? And that's what's going on in the church. It's too much counterfeit. It's too many people playing a religious game because they want fame, because they want money, because they want you to believe there's something that they're not. 
And the sad part is because you've had people sitting up under this counterfeit for so long. They refuse to see it for what it is. They've been so blinded that they can't see it for what it is. Even when that light of the Holy Spirit, even when that light of rightly dividing this truth exposes the counterfeit for what it is, because they've been sitting there for so long, they still choose to believe the counterfeit over the genuine article, which simply means they choose to believe Satan over God, because that's what it all boils down to. And God says we're living in a time where we have to start exposing the counterfeit. We have to walk in such a way. We have to talk in such a way. We have to live in such a way. More importantly, we have to teach and preach this gospel. We have to rightly divide this word in such a way that the light is turned on and everything that's not line upon line and precept upon precept is exposed. Because what exposing it does is it makes the hearer responsible. Because God not going to force you to serve him. God has never forced anybody to serve him. Just like God has never put anybody in hell. That's your choice. God lays it out. And he said, choose ye this day who you'll serve. Jesus said, if you ain't for me, you against me. If you want to go to the world, Black Sheep, who is an old hip-hop group, they made a perfect song. They said, the choice is yours. You can get with this or you can get with that. And that's what it boils down to. You're either going to receive the counterfeit or you're going to receive the genuine article, but you cannot have both. Why do I say you can't have both? I'm going to tell you why I say you can't have both. Because going back to the beginning of this study, if you go into a bank, if you go into a place of business and you have both counterfeit money and fake money and you present it, you're still getting locked up. All of your currency has to be genuine. All of your teaching has to be genuine. All of your anointing has to be genuine. All of your preaching has to be genuine. All of your lifestyle has to be genuine. And that brings me to the last subject. Your family and your friends. The people that you associate with. The people that you identify with. The people that you allow into your inner circle. Are they genuinely for you? Do they genuinely love you? Do they tell you the truth? Regardless of how mad you get, but because they love you, they tell you the truth. Or do they tell you what they want you to hear because they don't want to offend you? Better yet, do you tell them the truth? Women, I'm going to pick on you again. Will your girlfriend FaceTime you or come to your house or you go to her house because y'all going somewhere? And she got on an outfit that you wouldn't put on a corpse at their own funeral and say, girl, how I look. And you say, oh, girl, I like that. That's sharp. Where you get that from? Or she got on a wig that's so bad. And you say, oh, your hair is sharp. Who did your hair? But you call this person your friend. And you tell this person you love them. But you're going to let them go out in public looking like something from a sideshow. Is that genuine love? Even when it comes to family. Let me explain something to you. And I say this from the most sincere place in my heart. Everybody that's related to you is not family. Unless you are bonded with the DNA of the master. If you are saved, if you are born again, your family, as Jesus told it, is the ones that do the will of your father. That's your family. You might have some worldly relatives, but those who are covered 
with the blood of Christ, that's your family. Do you tell them the truth? Do you love them enough to tell them the truth? Do you love them enough to forgive them? Do you love them enough? You understand what I'm saying? We have to get to that place because God ain't playing. And as I shared with my wife on yesterday, God ain't writing nothing in pencil. When God records, he is writing nothing in pencil where he got to go back and erase and blow the stuff off and say, oops, that was wrong. No, everything he writes is in stone, in ink, because he's not changing it. His word says what his word says. And his word lets us know we are living in a day where Satan has power. He does lying wonders in the church. He has apostles and prophets and ministers in the church teaching in the name of religion. And they will use the name Jesus. Listen to me. They will say Jesus' name. But when you put what they're teaching, when you put what they're doing up to the light of the Holy Spirit, it does not stand. It's fraud. It's counterfeit. It's deceptive. But it's fake. It's phony. And too much of the church for too long has been receiving it. You need to check some of your favorite ministers. Get some of the interviews they do when they're just casually talking. Especially today. Those ministers that you, you follow so faithfully, those ministers that any book they put out, you go buy. Those ministers that you turn on their broadcast every time they come on because they got 511,000 members in their church. Find out what they teach about the Holy Spirit. Find out what they teach about holidays. Find out what they teach about homosexuality in the church. Find out what they teach about the word of God. Find out what they teach about these core things and then you decide who you're going to keep listening to. Because God is going to hold you responsible for what you believe and for what you teach and for how you live your life. Satan is good. Satan is real good. It's a story and I'm going to close with this. Go look in Kings. First, second Kings, you figure it out. There was a prophet of God. And the Lord let us know it was a prophet of his. God sent him on assignment. And when it was time to go, God gave him specific instruction as to what to do and what not to do. Very specific. He heard from God. And as he was going about his business, Somebody else had heard about him and they sent some messengers to catch him and say that God said, the angel of the Lord told me to tell you and he listened because the other person claimed to be a prophet too. And when he listened, as soon as he listened, God said, did I not tell you what to do, where to go? And because he was disobedient and he listened to the counterfeit, it cost him his life. Why would I share that with you? Because brothers and sisters, the bottom line is this. Listening to the counterfeit, going along to get along, following what has been passed down, when it's not the genuine article, is going to cost you your life. And I'm not just talking about your natural life. I'm talking about your spiritual life, eternal separation from God, because nothing counterfeit is going to enter into a genuine kingdom of God. Nothing. And the, the scary thing is, the Bible tells us that hell itself was only prepared for the devil and his angels. It won't prepare for us. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. But if you're following the counterfeit, you're on team Satan. You can't make it no plainer than that. Who are you listening to? What are you believing? What are you watching? When Holy Spirit is added to it, does it still stand? 
where the word of God rightly divided is added to the doctrine you believe, does your doctrine measure up? When you get dressed up for Easter and you get dressed up for Christmas and you decorate your house with that pagan tree and all the symbols on it, or you buy your chocolate covered cherries and your, your, your candy hearts and all that stuff and you call yourself a Christian, when you buying your kids little trick-or-treat bags and you calling yourself a Christian, when you doing all of these things, what makes you any different from the world? Jesus says, separate yourself. He don't care nothing about your fun. He don't care nothing about tradition. He don't care nothing about you wanting to do it for the kids because you don't want the kids to be ridiculed or seen different from other kids. You want your children to be seen different from other kids because you want your children to have a testimony that we live for God. But you got to make a choice. You have to start identifying what's real in your life. Always remembering a little leaven a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to leave you by saying this. If you really have a relationship with God, if you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, if you know this, if you truly believe that everything in this book is his word, line upon line, Precept upon precept. Then start checking what you believe. Start checking what you're being taught. Start checking what you're listening to. Start checking how you're raising your children. Start checking what you allow up under your house. Because God is not playing. And the sad part is Satan is not playing either. He got some deceitful workers out here doing some amazing things that's shaking some people up and got them believing lies. The next time you're in church and you flip over the drum set and kick the deacon in his face and you say you're being slain in the spirit, stop lying on God because that's not the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. The next time you go up in somebody's church and you say you want the gift of tongues and they start telling you to say this over and over again, ask them to show it to you in scripture. Because that's not how the gift of tongues is given. Brothers and sisters, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you these things. If God didn't get, tell me to tell you, I certainly wouldn't tell you these things. But I do love you. And I'm too afraid of God to not deliver his word and to set up and perpetrate a fraud. I know where God brought me from. I know what he delivered me from. I know what he's still delivering me from. I've seen the power of God in my life. And I've seen that counterfeit up close and personal. I praise his name. That he has me in a place where he's giving me discernment to, to distinguish the counterfeit from the genuine. And if he did it for me, I know for a fact he'd do it for you. But that's only if you want it. Because it's going to cause you to make some changes in your personal life. It's going to cause you to, to, to distinguish yourself from what the family or the friends may be doing. Come on over for Christmas. I don't celebrate that. I know you do and that's fine. I'll see you tomorrow. Why you don't say because it's not in scripture. It's a counterfeit. Brothers and sisters, this word, you're responsible for it. That's why I put it out there. Take the weight off me because I can't care. I'm not going to have your blood on my hands. But what you do with it is up to you. And I will say this. Be careful of who you have laying hands on you, praying over you. Be careful of who you allow to anoint you with oil and lay hands on you and pray over you. I don't know why the Lord would have me to say that right now because that was not in my notes, but I'm saying it to somebody. Be careful 
of who you allow to anoint you with oil and lay hands over you and pray over you. Because God has said it's a counterfeit. It's not of him. Be careful of who you ask to pray over your children. There's a transferring of spirits that's going on. There is an awakening of dormant spirits that's going on. So when your children start acting in ways that they didn't normally act, and when some spirits start to manifest themselves, it's because of who you allow to touch and anoint your children and pray over them, they don't woke up some dormant spirits. Trust God. Lead not to your own understanding. Walk in wisdom. Grow in grace. I will be back on regular schedule next Thursday. I promise. I don't know what the word is going to be. I'm waiting for Holy Spirit to give it to me. But until the end, know that I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying with you. Until we meet again, God bless.